So everything that we just heard before the break is going to complement this beautifully. Because let's be honest, hard times and stress are pretty synonymous. So everything we just heard, keep all that in mind because I may not actually be making those exact points, but they apply completely, especially those four rules. Uh, so I'm going to start by asking you all a question. Who here deals with stress every now and then? Congratulations, you're human. Because stress is inevitable. As long as we're in this world, we're going to face stress. And we can see proof of this by looking no further than the head of the one body, Jesus Christ himself. Uh, if you will take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22. And we're going to start in verse 39, and this is the night before Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. When he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as, as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The word rendered agony here, if you look at the definition of it, it's really just the state of being in a struggle. And it mentions that uh, while he was praying, his sweat was dropping as it were great drops of blood. And I've heard this taught that this, there is a medical condition known as uh, hematidrosis, which is where blood vessels within, uh, that, that are feeding the sweat glands, the, the capillaries kind of burst, and so blood comes out with the sweat. I've heard it t taught that that is exactly what's happening here, but the term sweating blood was also used figuratively, and we don't really use it anymore, but it was used as a, just to denote great stress. Uh, in modern times, we might be a little more familiar with the term sweating bullets. It's kind of the same thing. So whether he was literally sweating blood or figuratively, the point is the same. Dude was stressed out. <laughs> and this is the one man who always did everything right. He always did the Father's will. So stress is going to be present in our lives. And just because we face it doesn't necessarily mean we're doing something wrong. It also doesn't mean that sometimes we don't make mistakes, as Sarah pointed out, and we bring some stuff on ourselves. But the point is, if Jesus had stress, we are going to have stress too. He himself declared this in John 15. And in verse 18, he says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, and, and they, they will keep yours also. So this world is still under the authority of the devil. And as such, those who are walking with God are naturally going to be targets of his attention. And we're going to have to possibly deal with additional stresses in our lives. Uh, we don't have to turn there, but in 1 John chapter 3, we're also told not to be surprised or to marvel not if the world hates us and persecutes us. Regardless of the source of our stress, whether it's coming from the adversary or it's something that we've brought upon ourselves, we want to be concerned with how do we deal with it? How do we have victory over this? How do we keep it from influencing our thoughts and our actions in such a way that it's going to bring even more detriment to us? And once again, we need to consider the example that was given to us by Jesus Christ and the instruction that he gave to us. Uh, if you'll turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 11. And we will start in verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, 
and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And when he says, learn of me, that could also be rendered, learn from me. Uh, I'd like to read these verses 28 through 30 from the New International Version. If you're reading from the ESV, it's going to be extremely similar to this. Come to me, all you, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the Kenneth Weiss translation, this, these same verses are rendered, Come here to me, all who are growing weary to the point of exhaustion, and who have been loaded with burdens and are bending beneath their weight. And I alone will cause you to cease from your labor and take away burdens and thus refresh you with rest. Take at once my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find cessation from labor and refreshment for your souls. For my yoke is mild and pleasant, and my load is light in weight. In this we see words like rest, easy, light. But it's really easy not to feel this way when we're confronted by the things that the world throws at us, isn't it? Jesus began by establishing here that he would be revealing God as a father to us. And the secret to finding the rest that's spoken of here is having an intimate relationship with God just as Christ did. And thankfully, Brian kind of gave us a good overview of that last night. And this, of course, starts by coming to Christ. And we won't really get into this, but that can also be rendered as believing on him. And he also says here that we are to learn from him. He also speaks of being humble. So if we're going to learn from him, we should take a look at some of the other verses here that talk about being humble. So if you'll turn to James chapter 4. Verse 6, But he, God, giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 5, we'll begin, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So we can see from these verses that receiving grace from God is strongly correlated with being humble and submitting to him. And in fact, if you've been paying attention to these teachings, grace is a pattern that's kind of being repeated throughout them. Grace is what is absolutely necessary to reign over stress and our problems. And one of the great truths of grace is that God gives grace to the humble and not to the proud. Proud doesn't necessarily mean those who are outwardly boasting. It also means those who view themselves as self-sufficient, trusting in themselves and their own ways and thoughts. Those who have confidence in their own abilities, their own wisdom, their own resources, and their own past successes. Contrarily, the humble are those who willingly submit themselves to God, and we certainly learn this humility from Jesus Christ. He himself received God's grace because he was meek and humble. And it was because of that that he was exalted. Pride says, I got this. Humility says, I don't got this. At least not without God. You don't have to turn there, but in John 1, 16, it's also stated that we've received grace for grace through Jesus Christ. That phrase, grace for grace, can also be rendered as grace upon grace, or one grace after another grace. The Amplified Bible actually translates these words as one grace after another, and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. The Companion Bible defines this expression of grace for grace as grace in place of grace, new grace, continuous and unintermitted, ever fresh grace according to the need. 
And this can actually be seen and reflected in what God demonstrated to Israel in the giving of manna. Even though that pointed to Christ, Christ points us towards grace. And the manna wasn't something to be stored up. It was new every day according to their day's need. Another great truth about grace is that in every situation in our life, God will provide the grace that we need at the time that we need it. Now, Jesus spoke about his yoke and his burden. And throughout the scriptures, to be under a yoke means to be in servitude to someone else. It's to be compelled to do their will rather than one's own. And it's very familiar what Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. So what exactly was Jesus' yoke? Turn to John chapter 5. In verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For these things, soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Uh, skip ahead to verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus was yoked to his Father. He always chose God's thoughts and ways rather than his own. That was the yoke that he bore and the burden that he carried, which he described as being easy and light. He found rest in knowing his Father and declared that he could do nothing of himself. Jesus also said that without him, we could do nothing. If you'll turn to John 15. In verse 4, Jesus speaking, saying, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. As Jesus was yoked to the Father, we are now to be yoked to our Lord. And this is actually a very large part of making Jesus our Lord. It's saying, that is the man that I want to esteem above all others. That's the man I want to follow after. That's the man that I want to learn from and to use as an example for how I want to live my life. He also spoke about finding rest for our souls. And we can read about this rest in Hebrews chapter 4. Now we'll start in verse 1. Let us therefore fear or reverence, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to have come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Uh, skip ahead to verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and of, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Here it is declared that we must labor, or it could be rendered, make a diligent effort to enter into that rest. Except that our effort is actually ceasing from our own works. And in learning, meditating, and acting upon the word of God. In verse 9, it says that there remains a rest and compares it to God resting from his work. That's a correlation of the Sabbath. The word that's rendered rest here literally means the keeping of a Sabbath. 
Uh, and we can read in Isaiah what God really wanted when he gave man the Sabbath. So turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Starting in verse 13, if thou shalt turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. What the Sabbath really meant was a, is, is meant as a specific time to cease from performing one's own will, to focus on God and His will. And this is something that we can practice every day to find continual rest. If we want such rest, we do so by ceasing from our own works, just as Christ did not pursue His own work. We saw before that grace can be exactly what we need at the time that we need it, and this includes a whole smorgasbord of things, including protection from harm, knowledge and insight into a situation, wisdom to know what to do, the right words to speak, strength to carry out the words, works that he has given us, and the resources we need to be successful to accomplish what God wants done. If we were to continue on in what we were reading in Hebrews chapter 4, the, verse 16 closes it by saying that we are to come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 8 states, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye have, always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. It's God's grace that will allow us to victoriously get through every situation that we face. This does not necessarily mean, however, that we have absolutely no responsibility on our part. It's not attained by our own efforts. It's humbly received from God. But we still have our part in the work, just as our example, Jesus Christ, did. We can see this in John chapter 5. I am in the wrong chapter. But Jesus answered them, it was verse 17, Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. God was working in him, but he also worked. You don't have to turn there, but later in John 9, 4, he stated, I must work the works of him that sent me. Jesus worked, but he learned how to do the work of his Father that gave him the strength, or learned to work the work that his Father gave him in the strength that his Father provided. The Apostle Paul also learned of how to work alongside God through grace. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul was able to say, just as Jesus did, that his father worked. And that he worked. He learned from the master, Jesus Christ. The yoke that Paul bore was easy, and the burden he carried was light. And he described the things that he suffered as being light and momentary. And when you look at the things that he suffered, that's kind of hard to believe sometimes. 
Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is the Apostle Paul once again speaking in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Turn to Romans 8. In verse 18 we read, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Turn again to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I promise we're done flipping after this. <laughs> Starting in verse 7. Paul is again speaking, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The answer to Paul's prayer here was that God's grace was all that he needed. It was enough for any situation that he would face. And he learned to be strong in that grace that is in Christ. This is why he was also able to say in Romans that tribulations or mental pressures, stresses that we face, were something to glory in. Now, it's not that we should actually glory in the trouble or the stress itself, but we can learn to recognize it as yet another opportunity to practice relying upon God's grace in our lives. And to seek after the work that God would have for us to do, which then in turn brings us rest. Instead of succumbing to the afflictions in life, we overcome them by standing in the grace of God and by looking to the God of all grace. We cast our cares upon him because we know that he cares for us. And Sarah went into this a little bit, and we cast our cares to him. We trust that he will provide us with that very grace that we need when we need it. Trying to take it back and figure it out ourselves is the opposite of receiving grace and will not produce rest. That is not ceasing from our own works. Uh, but we are human, and we do this every now. We give something initially to God, we cast it upon him, and we get a little impatient. A month passes, a week, a day, five minutes. <laughs> we start to think maybe God doesn't actually have it. I'm just going to take that back and work on it myself. <laughs> that's not ceasing from our own works. That's once again pursuing our own works, and that's not going to bring us the rest that we're looking for. A huge part of entering into God's rest is also being in constant communication with him. And sometimes we don't even know what it is that we need to be asking for. And thankfully, Joey covered that for us. We have speaking in tongues in that situation. And that's why that's a huge part of having an intimate relationship with God. Being in constant communication with God is also what allows us to more proficiently hear from God and to know what it is that he has for us to do at any particular moment. To recognize his grace that he has for us at that specific need at the time that we need to take hold of it. And thankfully, I believe Andrew will be covering that for us in more detail tomorrow. So don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> we need to learn from Jesus Christ how to take upon us the same yoke that he took upon him, to be able to cease from our own works and pursue the works of the Father so that we can enter into the same rest and to consider any of the troubles or stresses that face us as a light matter and as a burden which is easy to be carried. While looking ahead to the glory that awaits us, just as when Christ prayed in the garden, he received the answer to his prayer in that most stressful moment, that he was able to carry that as a light burden and a temporary affliction because of the joy and the glory which was set before him. 
Thank you. I love you guys.